Well, it is budget season right across the country, including in Ottawa. So we thought today on No Nonsense, we would do kind of a state of the nation, economically speaking. Now, here are a few fun facts. Actually, they're really depressing facts. The OECD projects Canada will be the worst performing economy among the 38 advanced countries over the next 10 years. Canada is one of only eight advanced countries where real incomes are lower today than before the pandemic as inflation continues. I could go on and list a lot of those things, but we are going to take a look at what is really going on in this economy with just one of my favorite guests always, Kevin Page, the founding president and CEO of the Institute of Fiscal Studies and Democracy at the University of Ottawa. And he was Canada's first ever parliamentary budget officer. That was way back in 2008, and that position, of course, continues and others have been through it. Well, Mr. Page, what do you make of those dire statistics, those comments? Are we really in serious trouble? Well, I mean, those are, uh, as you said, they're dire. And those are, you know, the, the glass is half empty, not half full kind of projections and it definitely is the case that you know the economy is weak right now. Uh, we also have uh, we've seen significant population growth. So you kind of put those two things together. The economy is weak, and we'll talk about that. And yeah. we have significant population growth. So our you know our GDP per capita, our income per capita numbers you know are you know are going they are very weak. They're going in the wrong direction. But you know I think we you know we'll get beyond this period of time. Like we, you know we're you know. The Bank of Canada is trying to, uh, you know, do a soft landing. I think once if we can get through the soft landing, we get inflation, you know, a little bit lower than it is now. I think growth will come back as interest rates come back down. It'll be a different conversation about growth prospects in Canada. I was just reading something from uh, Jack Mintz the other day, uh, also a leading economist. He says that that really what we're facing now is, in general, a poor economy. That what the this current government has done and where we are now is that they have taxed and redistributed wealth, but we are not growing the economy. And you hear that from David Dodge and former governors of the bank who say, look, I mean, the debt levels are are outrageous and off the charts, but I'm actually worried about growth because that's the future. That's the only way we get from A to B. Yeah, I think it's, um, I mean, first of all, those are uh, eminent people, Mr. Dodge, Mr. Mintz. Um, and, you know, I would say, like, right now, like, we reason we have slow growth right now is because we have high real interest rates, high interest rates. Yeah. So we have, we have slow growth now on purpose. And you could argue, you know, there's a longer term structural issue, with, you know, people use the words productivity, and, you know, but I think right now, the reason for the low growth numbers right now is that it's on purpose. We It's just by design. We are trying to slow the growth of the economy to reduce demand pressures, to get inflation now, which is just under 3%, probably closer to 2%. And so once, you know, if we were, you know, to start to see lower interest rates, I think you'd start to see a lot more consumption, a lot more investment, much higher GDP, and a glass, you know, half uh, full as opposed to half empty that, you know, kind of predictions we're getting from the OECD. So this is by design. Yeah, no, I think you're right. And everybody makes that argument, really, that if we're going to get inflation under control and let the bank be able to bring it down, there's got to be slower growth. But we're also continuing to see governments borrow and spend at record levels, a little bit of a version of this modern monetary theory, right? That you just keep borrowing and just keep spending. And as long as the rates eventually come down, it doesn't cost you that much. I mean, can, there's got to be a point at which that comes to an end. Yes. Yeah. And I think we're at a point now that you want monetary and fiscal policy working together so, um, you know, we have uh, monetary policy trying to slow the economy, reduce inflationary pressures. We don't want to be running high deficits, deficit financing, long term structural programs in this environment <clears throat> that could be, you know, boosting demand pressures, boosting inflation. But I honestly, like, to be frank, I, I think 
there's a bit, you know, the doomsday stuff rings a bit hollow for me when it comes to our fiscal numbers. Again, I'm a former priority budget officer, yeah. uh, kind of a quote unquote fiscal watchdog. So like, it's hard for me to get depressed <clears throat> about a deficit in the $40 billion range, which is about a percent and a half when um, it's sitting at six or six percent or higher in the United States. So if we were to have a comparable deficit in the U.S., our deficit in Canada would be $170 billion. So um, if we were to look at the deficits in Canada, you know, at 1.5 percent of $40 billion right now, and we were to compare where deficits were in the 80s or early 90s, you know, you know, one and a half percent now compared to maybe five, six percent on average in the 80s and 90s. Again, we can go on and on about debt and yeah. the interest costs and the debt, but the numbers now, like even if you have a new government coming in, they're not horrible numbers. They're numbers that, you know, they're far better than OECD numbers on deficits and debt. I get that. The problem with the U.S. comparison is that their economy is growing and ours is stalled. Yeah, and I would add to that, Senator, that if, if we were, uh, if we threw in another like $125 billion of fiscal stimulus, our economy wouldn't be growing at a higher pace. You know, one thing that is true, you know, these higher interest rates are biting consumption and investment much harder on Canadians than Americans. We went in different directions in the 2008 financial crisis. U.S., you know, they reduced their you know mortgage interest costs relative to disposable income. Ours went up. So we're carrying a lot more debt at the household level and even financial level than we are in the Americans. So when you raise interest rates, it's going to bite us a lot harder. And I think it's the high, we're a high debt economy. High interest rates are really hurting us. Okay, I'm going to come back to that. I just was looking at this this piece from Jack Mint. So he says GDP per capita fell four or five points compared with the U.S. or the average G7 country. Then he went on to say this. We have roughly, by comparison, the same standard of living. I find this tricky. As West Virginia, it's one of the poorest states in America. But if you look at the numbers, that's where we line up. Yeah, so I, mean, I think you know, there's um, one of the reasons we, we're seeing this particularly significant movement in GDP per capita numbers now. And just to back up Mr. Mintz's point, so we go to the fourth quarter numbers that we had at the end of 2023. Mm -hmm. On a year-over-year -year basis, we were growing about 1%. <clears throat> Population was growing by 3%. So obviously GDP per capita is, is, we're declining. So that gap between us and the US averages and some US state averages, it's moving in a bad direction for us right now. <laughs> and so again, we have some big you know, issues to talk about around, you know, the good immigration levels for us, for, you know, for Canada, productivity growth rates, uh, you know, uh, for Canada, that, you know, this conversation hopes, hopefully will be part of the 2025 campaign. But I think, again, right now, we're purposely trying to slow the economy down. So I think all these numbers, because of the high population growth, uh, is are kind of skewed in, in Canada's disfavor. Yeah. Um, relative to West Virginia, I mean, I think you and I probably have been to some of those southern states. Yep. Um, you know, when I travel to, you know, different parts of Canada, and or I go to, you know, some of those southern states, I, I see a much higher quality of life in Canada overall. So I'm a bit surprised. I think you can get a bit fooled by some, you know, per capita. There's definitely wealth. It's very, you know, yeah. there's more income disparity in the U.S. than there is in Canada. So this boosts their average numbers to our numbers. But on balance, like, you know, um, we're still a very wealthy country. Yeah, no. OK, let's go through some issues uh, bit by bit just so we can focus on them. So here these are bits and pieces that I have sitting on my desk at all times. Poor productivity in Canada. Everybody and their dog agrees with this. In an hour, a Canadian worker produces just over 70% of what an American worker produces in that same hour. What does that mean? Yeah, the, <clears throat> it means that, um, you know, Canadian workers basically have one hand tied behind their back. So um, I know you come from Saskatchewan. Actually, I grew up in Northwestern Ontario, you know, if we're, if I was to try to, you know, if I was, um, you know, my dad was probably shoveling potash out of a hopper car, you know, at my age, uh, by shovel, you know, this. So if you give my, if my dad instead was doing it by, you know, he had uh, some heavy duty, you know, piece of equipment, he'd be moving a lot more potash, you know, as opposed to get, you know, with a shovel. So, 
Like we've right. seen Canada has, we have not invested. Uh, we've seen, you know, investment, capital investment, uh, in residential, non-residential, machine and equipment investment flatline for many years. And I think it's that weak investment that is, is hurting us. I think, unfortunately, just in terms of timing, where we want to have these conversations about boosting productivity, but the fact that, you know, we have to have these high real interest rates to get inflation under control is kind of the opportunity cost is, is really that high because we should be transitioning our economy to more high productivity, more cleaner economy. And it's hard to do that when you have high interest, high real interest rates. And and the other thing we're seeing is that most of the job growth is is in the public sector, in the literally on Parliament Hill and the offices that surround it. That is not the kind of work you're talking about, which which stimulates growth in the economy or helps us transition to a, nor, a new economy. It's bureaucracy. Yeah, no argument there, Senator. I think um, uh, you know, if we look at this government, you know, the Liberal government since 2015, we look at what has happened to you know, program spending overall, like you're going to see a big component. Yep. You know, it's been a two percentage point increase in program spending relative to GDP under the Liberal government. That's enormous. Uh, more than half of that is coming from direct program spending. And a big part of that increase is just the operations of government. So, I mean, the best I could say about that in this very, in this, you know, slow down, slow growth economy is that, you know, boosting the public sector when the economy is really weak provides some bottom stabilize, some stabilization to the economy. So if we would have been in fiscal austerity mode in the past two years, instead of talking about weak growth or flat growth, it would be negative growth. It would be, be even worse. <laughs> that's, that, that's the, uh, all right, just, uh, I, I just want to move through some of these issues quickly. So uh, the tax question, um, combined tax rate over 50% in eight of the provinces, we have highest taxes, the fifth highest in the OECD, which creates a competitive challenge and businesses and other countries don't want to invest here. And it's uh, contributing, obviously, uh, to our own costs as we continue to borrow. What We used to be, I think, more competitive in terms of business taxes with the U.S., and we seem to have lost that. Yeah, I think, well, you know, Donald Trump had some, you know, he made a significant uh, effort to reduce corporate taxes in the U.S. That kind of changed our relative position. Yeah, I think you know basically I would say factually you know if you compare Canada's um, you know taxes you know relative to GDP we are like we are probably you know at the high end of OECD countries so we are are a relatively high tax economy again there are a lot of very rich OECD economies higher you know the 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 Netherlands and particularly uh, Sweden Finland these these are also high tax economies have high per capita incomes. So, but we are a high tax economy and we're also an economy that has a fair bit of uh, income wealth disparity. And um, so it's it's a bit of a, we're in a hard place right now because you can't really increase taxes to deal with the deficit because you're gonna hurt competitiveness. Uh, you, it's, you know, you've got a weak economy. Uh, on the other hand, we still have these longer term structural issues we're gonna have to deal with respect to income disparity, wealth disparity in this country, which produces instability down the road. Okay, uh, on the question of tax, or obviously carbon tax, uh, we've heard the chorus from premiers, from people everywhere. Most people now agree. Most economists, including even your one of your successors, the 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 current PBO, that the carbon tax actually hurts more than it helps. You really are not. Uh, compensated for all of the money you spend, and we can't even possibly figure out the real impact uh, of the carbon tax on the economy because it's there at every level. You know, you it's there when you put the seed in the ground, and it's there when you take the weed off, and it's there when you create the bread that's in the store, and all like that. It's just has a huge impact. Um, in terms of rising prices and forcing prices up, and that's hurting people. Well, I would say, um, 
it's you know it's it's every bit as complex as you described in terms of the environment um you know in terms it's not easy to increase the price on anything in the environment where yeah. people are really stretched you know dealing with affordability issues i think the plan in terms of carbon pricing when you know when we had this discussion a few years ago the thought was that we had to put a price on carbon there's different ways you can do that I think the government decided that you know was going to you know let provinces do what they can. So there's provinces like uh, British Columbia and Quebec; they have their own systems, and it, they will set prices on carbon. We have, and they will you know meet you know the kind of commitments that the government thought were important for these nationally determined determined contributions on emissions. And the other provinces, if you don't put a system in place, the you know the government was going to come in and put a system in place. So we have two provinces where the prices are going up on 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 carbon. And there's no offsets. There's no rebates. There's no, you know, we take with one hand and give you with the other. Yeah. The other eight provinces and the premiers, like premiers, are, they're political people. You understand this better than I do. They have to get elected. And, you know, the, the number one, two or three issue is affordability. And you're saying on, you know, in a couple of days that, you know, that people that are you know, trying to get to work with, you know, with trucks and, and et cetera, they're going to have to spend a lot more to fill up their tanks. They're saying like this is not a good time to be increasing prices. On the other mm -hmm. hand, people are saying what we need in this environment to get more investment is certainty. You got to tell us what are you going to be doing? What's the price going to be? You got to tell us not just this year, but I need to know what's the price going to be out to 2030. So, and you have to commit to that. Otherwise, investment dollars are not going to follow that. Um, so we asked like we asked central bankers to tell us what are you going to, how are you going to behave? So we can we can get into a conversation about setting mm -hmm. interest. But, you know, the government of the Bank of Canada is going to say, if I get inflation back to 2%, this policy rate, which is sitting at 5%, is going to go back down to 2%, you know, or 2 to 3%. Um, so he's giving us some uh, some planning that we can plan on. So we're, we can be close to seeing reduction in interest rates. Now, the, you know, on carbon pricing, yeah, if people are stretched, you, you can, you know, on the affordability issue, there's an enormous political pressure. Like, I, I'm sitting here in Montreal at McGill University, you know, this is, you know, a few days ago, we had um, uh, a, a, you know, a very important funeral for a very important prime minister. I was there. <laughs> yeah. And thank you, Senator. But I, what we remember this important prime minister for, some say the most important foreign policy prime minister we had, maybe yeah. in our history of our country, we remember him for something like the GST or free trade. Like, the, he paid an enormous political price in order to move through, you know, to go from a manufacturing sales tax or to a GST. Now, are we prepared politically to pay a price, actually to hold on to a carbon price? But even as Canadians, I think if Canadians were, we look harder at what, what's happening to our per capita emissions, is it important for us as a country to get to those 2030, 2050 targets? Like, what, how do we see our role in the world? How do we see our contribution of investment? Like, we need to get prices on carbon. So, like, again, this is a big issue. It's going to play out in the, certainly in the next election. But, but here's the thing, which is I think if you're going to, well, A, the prime minister um, allowed there to be a change in Atlantic Canada. So he already... You know, he put a crack in his in in his own wall there. Um, but we're also to the best that anybody can measure an attempt to do this, that the the carbon tax on individuals, not corporately, and that may be the distinction that some government has to make eventually, but that it's not having an impact on emissions. Because if I need to drive three hours to work, I still have to drive three hours to work if there's no bus, train, or boat, you know. So I'm going to continue to do that because I have to. So in fact, we're not even accomplishing what this tax was supposed to accomplish, which was to change behavior and reduce emissions. Yeah. And I would, I think I would, um, I would say this truth that, yeah, um, in, in terms of, we would hope there would be more progress in terms of bending the arc on our, our, our emissions as a country. And, you know, we can go sector by sector and see we have yeah. made some progress and we could say, well, maybe that progress really doesn't have a lot to do with carbon pricing. And so maybe we're not getting the full benefit of carbon pricing. But I think, again, if you go back to the system, the way it was designed was increments, small increments, um, you know, a year by year increments in the price of, of on carbon so that we would change our behavior over time. We're, we're getting to $80 per ton. 
We're talking about, you know, by 2030, trying to get, which will scare people, $170 per ton. There are people who are saying maybe at 170, it should be 250. So, but the idea was to make it small. When you make it small, you don't, the idea was that you don't feel the pain as much and maybe behavior doesn't change as much. So maybe like there's, with this plan in place, it was going to change behavior very slowly. And I, I don't know, like I just, my own personal self, again, I grew up in Northwestern Ontario. We all own trucks. I owned a Jeep. I drive a Mini Cooper now. Uh, I ride my bicycle to work. So it's changed my behavior. But you're a city guy. And you see, this is the 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 discussion, how it always breaks down. When, when I fly from Ottawa to Saskatchewan, uh, A, who knows what the carbon footprint of that is, somebody would measure, but that's me going home. But then I have another three hours in a vehicle. And there is absolutely no other way for me to make that trip except in my vehicle. It's winter. There are moose and deer on the road. It's 40 below. I'm not going in a Mini Cooper or on my bike. Yeah. Well, rest assured, it was hard for me to go from my Jeep to a Mini <laughs> Cooper. Uh, I bet. Two cars to one car. And it, it's, yeah, I didn't grow up in Ottawa. <laughs> uh, so I really sympathize you know, with uh, you know people that have to fill up their trucks, hundreds of dollars to fill up those trucks, and you know, there's no choice. Yeah. And we know that you know the truck industry is changing. It's you know, and there's debates going on. Even like, how fast can we move on EVs? Is there really the market for EVs? Lots of debates about how we're going to you know charging these things. But yeah. again, we're trying to, you know, I think there was a governor of Washington said like, we're like the first generation to feel the sting of climate change. And we're the generation that has to make the difference. And so yeah. this is a generational, and this is a, a lot of behavior change. Yeah, and it's like, it, it is definitely painful. I hear, I go back to my hometown Thunder Bay multiple times a year and I get an earful of it. And um, yeah, they're not riding bicycles to the paper mills or, or right. to the mine. Uh, let, let me just, Ray, and then we'll move on to some other topics, but um, sometimes I think politicians say things out loud that they don't mean to, or they say the private part out loud. When Stephen Gilbo talks about our intent is really to have fewer cars, colder homes in the winter, hotter homes in the summer, you know, we, we're going to make that very expensive so you change your behavior. They're really targeting the agriculture sector, which targets the food sector as well. Um, what they're really saying to you is you're going to have to live less comfortably and with less choice than you live right now. And I don't know how you get people on side when we've had generations in this country saying, I want my kids to live a better life than the life I had. I heard that from mine and, you know, all of that. This argument is, it's its a hard sell when we can see that the choices are here. And unless the international client, you know, unless China and India do something about the environment, it doesn't really matter whether you ride your bike or I drive my car. No, no. Um, yes, you're right. I would <laughs> say uh when we were speaking by or, or I, it's it, you know, by ourselves, our behavior is not going to make a fundamental difference. But I think, do we want leaders to talk about um, where we need to get to in terms of change behavior? And I think, effectively, what we're talking about is a very different energy system. You know, an energy yeah. what, moving from one energy system which generated enormous wealth for us, and um, like my standard of living compared to say with my my parents, you know, or my grandparents who came from Poland, Ukraine. It's fundamentally different. Absolutely. You know, thank you, Canada, very much. And, you know, honestly, thank you, you know, carbon energy systems very much. But now we have to sing over the next few decades, we have to change. We need a very different energy system. And so we're st we still need energy to grow the economy, but it has to come from different sources. And that's a massive engineering infrastructure problem. It's going to require enormous investment and some behavior change. But it, we shouldn't be so like, you know, you know, it's like we shouldn't be so de depressed that our life is going to be miserable because we go from one energy system to another energy system. We're still going to be able to, you know, get from point A to point B. I'm still going to go home to Thunder Bay to see my sister and my brother, but yeah. I'll you know, potentially five, 10 years from now, it'll be in an EV vehicle. It won't be in the old Jeep that I was taking, you know, for the past decade. So we, yeah, we will change and, but we'll get energy from different sources, but we will need more energy 
and it'll have to be much cleaner. Yeah, I think everybody agrees with that. It's just the selling process of saying, put on your hair shirt, uh, you know, because you're going to have to pay for us to get from the old system to the new system. I don't actually see it because I see these industries like the oil and gas sector and like the agriculture sector actually doing this in real time. They are transitioning. They are coming up with the new technologies. And then we hear from the other side, which is, you know, but but it's not enough. Sacrifice more. Sacrifice more. Yeah, I think... Um... It feels like sacrifice. And I think um, I'm sure it felt it was enormous, say, political sacrifice that um, the late Prime Minister Maroney paid, yeah. made when he, he brought in, he went from a manufacturing sales tax to a goods and service tax. Yeah. Um, by putting in that tax, we had enormous amount of revenues um, that allowed us to you know, fundamentally change our, our fiscal position in the late mid 1990s to a, a very strong fiscal position by, you know, by say, you know, the early 2000s. And um, so he made a difference, but he paid an enormous political price. And so, again, a lot of discussion around how do we use political capital? Are we prepared to make sacrifices? How do politicians change public sentiment? Like right. that is so hard, but that is not a new issue. I've been reading um, uh, Meacham's book on Lincoln right now. And I'm just like last yeah. night I was getting to that section where Lincoln was talking about in one of these debates. <laughs> how do you change public sentiment? So it's like not a new issue. And um, like to what extent can we paint pictures of people of the future that say, OK, I'm going to make a little bit. I'm going to sacrifice. I'm going to change my behavior. Prices are going to go up, but we're going to adjust. Yeah. And, and I think economists. Um, you know, public service, you know, ex governments, we have to facilitate that change, minimize like, you know, the, the disruption to the extent that is possible. That's exactly. All right. I'm going to, I know our time is running here. So I want to, I want to touch on a few other um, points here. The subsidy culture, um, the whole debate over Stellantis and Volkswagen, one, one giveaway is worth triple the cost of all the federal aid to all corporations in the country in a year. $44 billion over 10 years for battery plants. It's the highest transfer of public dollars ever to a private company. Now, to your earlier point, energy transition is going to require $125 to $140 billion a year of spending. I get that. And and it's these are numbers that are hard to consume. But are we going about it the right way? And and on two points that I'll have you answer. One is it's a very expensive outlay of cash. Secondly, we're actually not keeping the intellectual property that goes along with this, the building of those batteries. That goes back to head office or head country. And that's one of the knocks on this country, which is why we don't have growth and development and productivity and wealth is because we're selling or giving away, not even selling the stuff that's most valuable. Yeah. So I think, this, you know, the battery subsidies are probably something we're going to look back on five, 10 years from now, and we'll be in a better position to realize, you know, did we, was that the right move, the size of the subsidies? Um, was it, did we, you know, in fact, maybe like, even the numbers that we have bandied about around these subsidies may turn out to be somewhat less because we won't see the actual production of the batteries to be quite as large over the next five or 10 years. So maybe the numbers won't be as big. But I think like it is not, like it is a complicated supply chain that, you know, we're struggling with right now. And, and I would say like, you know, it is, it is just the reality that China right now owns a large part of the of the you know the EV industry uh the rare earth industry the battery industry the uh the rare you know the the um those rare earth magnets that are important for the EV engines they own this stuff and they subsidize this stuff so it is not a level playing field it's hard to be capitalist in an environment when you have you know state actors that are enormous you know with billions of populations a billion and a half in the case of China that own like 80% of this industry so and then the US which are also subsidizing so in fact effectively i think what happened on the size of those on that particular subsidy 
is, you know, we got into a bit of a, a race, you know, with the Americans through the Inflation Reduction Act. And so we ended up enormous. We've seen this play out in other, other industries, agriculture, to protect our homegrown industries. We're, we, You know, how do we create level playing fields? I think Canada wants this supply chain on the on the knowledge side of it and on this potential spinoff side of it. I think it kind of remains to be seen where we'll go with that. I think we want we want to be manufacturing. I think you know these components that are going to be critical to this new energy environment. And um, like I hope, like again, I come from an immigrant family, like as I'm sure you do. You know, one or two generations. You know, we had, you know, I've just not long ago read Elon Musk's book. Yes. Elon Musk was at Queen's University. I was at Queen's University. We should have kept Elon Musk. You know, whatever yeah. you think of Elon Musk, exactly. he's manufacturing everything. So, you know, it's quite possible out of this growth of immigrants that we're seeing right now, and we're saying, oh, we got a housing problem, et cetera. We might have a few Elon Musk in that group that will actually generate some of these enormous companies, because that's been the history of Canada. Yeah. And well, you've raised a, a, another issue there, which is, you know, are we bringing in the right kind of immigrants? Our numbers have gone way up. I think we can handle quite easily in this country bringing in about 350,000 people a year. We're up over a million. But are those people, the people, are they Elon Musk? Are they people that uh, are, are going to, that have the skill set to work in the new economy, because what we're saying and hearing from the provincial premiers is no, uh, it's very much a drain on the, the social system, the healthcare system, the housing system, that we are not bringing people that are ready, I ready to go to work. Yeah. So again, there's a, there's a discussion about the size of the numbers, you know, in terms of the increase in immigration, the increase in um, non-permanent residents, the increase in, in refugees, uh, and yeah. how this has, uh, were we ready? Did we have a plan in place, you know, to, you know, to, to integrate these good people, you know, into our country? I think it's, it's still too early to tell, like, in terms of what yeah. the output will play. Like, but I think you, you and I probably both know what in real, you know, politicians talk about investments on everything. Anytime they spend a dollar, it's an investment. But I think, you know, usually investment, like the way I remembered it growing up was that it, is, it had a sense of you're sacrificing something for the future. So yeah. whether it's carbon pricing or whether it's like increasing your savings to, so that you can have a better retirement or whether it's uh, increasing the population of the country as these people coming in and then having a private market respond with more housing, et cetera. Like this is what investment feels like. It It's not easy. It's disruptive. And um, but you pay now. You, you Actually, it feels like you're sacrificing now for a payoff that's going to come later. And that's hard to do in a political context. I, just on the housing thing for a moment, because I had this on my list of things to ask you, Peter Routledge, the superintendent of financial institutions. Uh, just in the last few days, has issued a warning to banks. Um, basically, he's saying, look, um, with the interest rates as high as they are, people are are facing these kind of trigger rates where, where they're not going to, if their mortgage is coming due, and millions are, uh, they're not going to even meet the interest rates payments, never mind pay anything on the principal. And this is a huge problem for the individual. It's a problem for the banks. Like, are we talking about maybe risking the sound banking system that we've got? But I mean, he's saying you need tighter risk assessments for all of this now. It's a different world. Yeah, I think the longer we keep uh, interest rates at the policy interest rate of the Bank of Canada at five percent. Remember uh, when this rate started to go up, we were sitting at you know, twenty five basis points. You know, we went very quickly over a year and a half to five percent. We have inflation now, year over year inflation, a little bit lower than three percent. Um, and we have, so if you look at the interest rates that our people are paying, a five year mortgage conventional rate probably six and a half percent, variable rates at six and a half percent. I have a son who bought a house, paid way too much for it in Ottawa. Yep. He's got two little kids. Uh, he's working. His wife's working. It's, she's a teacher. He, and um, like he, he, again, 
if these interest rates don't come down, he's going to need a lot of help. And, you know, and so they're betting on these interest rates to come down. Like you have to ask yourself right now, and Mr. Macklin is a very bright person. All these governors of Bank of Canada do a fantastic job. They're good people. They're smart people. But we're playing a high risk poker game right now. You're keeping, you know, with all the debt in this economy and, and the record high mortgage interest costs relative to disposable income and inflation already in the target range, in the one to three percent range. Nothing wrong with inflation rate. I say closer to 3% than 2% when you got all this debt because it actually reduces the heaviness of this debt, having prices run a little bit higher, having wages run a little bit higher. So like, I think now's the time in a week or two now, I'm really, I've got my fingers and toes crossed and Mr. Macklin, at least a small adjustment, 25 basis points. Like you're starting to see this conversation in the US, maybe three cuts, maybe more cuts. And because they also have a fair bit of debt, even though their economy is growing much faster. Uh, yeah. Again, a lot more fiscal stimulus in the U.S. than in Canada right now. Yeah. So you're saying get at it, even even if it's something, send the signal that that there is hope before we have. Well, I mean, this could literally crash if you can't renew your mortgage because you, you don't meet the test anymore. That's a huge problem, but it's millions of dollars in default. So we need to move. Yeah, because I mean, uh, bank sheets, you know, a big part of yeah. the you know the growth of their bank sheets are these homes, right? They're enormous financial assets for banks as well. Okay, a couple of more questions here. I just wanted to finish off on the subsidy issue. I was, I started to make a list here today on, on, and I just stopped after five. The Canada Growth Fund, the Strategic Innovation Fund, the Net Zero Emissions Fund, the Infrastructure Bank, uh, the taxes that are there. Then you've got the whole other set of programs that are uh, based around productivity. Now we're actually even hearing um, discussion about governments forcing pension plans to invest in Canada to kind of make up for the fact that foreigners aren't investing here we're down to some ridiculously no lum, uh, low number i think we're the lowest in about seven countries so can we really solve this problem with just more stimulus programs more spending programs when there's no sense of what the outcome needs to be or no way to test it or force it i mean if, if I've got my money in a pension fund, honestly, I want them to invest in things that are going to make money so I can retire. I don't want them to pick winners and losers in the Canadian economy based on what the government thinks should happen this week. Yeah, so certainly, Senator, I'm with you with respect to the management of the investment funds. Um, they, I think they should go. They, their job is to protect um you know, to grow, you know, to grow the size of the investment. So, you know, to make sure that, you know, we're the, you know, we're, there are going to be benefits there for us and we don't need further premium increases. So, yeah, I don't think, I think in terms of investment, attracting investment, I think in this current environment, I think in terms of you know, the commitment towards energy transition, not in Canada, but throughout the, throughout the, the world, that we're going to need governments actually not only to set targets, but they're going to have to use their purse in order to kind of you know give lower financing to companies, particularly in these high interest rate environments. So if the infrastructure bank or if the growth funds or the other funds that you mentioned or these tax credits, they're designed to make a difference to encourage people to to, to make that shift. Now you you quoted a number, like we've seen different numbers, like the actual the numbers of investment um is you know to to actually get to a a, a different type of in infrastructure like they're in the tens and tens of billions of dollars so we're, we're probably as much as the government's put on place in terms of subsidies growth funds infrastructure funds we're gonna there's gonna be more of this not less less of this in the future but yeah we're gonna need private sector investment as well but and that's the point they're money into it like this it, it, it we're not this this kind of behavior does not attract foreign investment what they do is they look at an economy that says it's kind of controlled by a series of government programs or you know orders and that doesn't really uh, attract foreigners as you say they like predictability tell them how high the carbon tax is going to be they can live with that but they don't want programs that come and go that have no outcomes yeah so I think it's important for Canadians to see exactly what you just said. We need to know what are the objectives of these, you know, these funds that are coming from the growth fund or the infrastructure bank or the subsidies. Can we can we connect the dots between that and, you know, and the emissions? 
and improvements and increased productivity and competitiveness. And if we can't, then we have to, you know, we have to put pressure on the government to actually improve the, you know, these programs. And underneath these programs, we don't have a lot of what people call infrastructure plans or needs assessments. You know, other right. countries, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, they said, you know what, this is a really big, hard thing to go from, you know, current emissions to much lower emissions. We're going to need actually a needs assessment sector by sector. We're going to have to do this across you know, at least at the government, so we can hold the government to account. So the government probably doesn't want to be held to account. So we don't, because we, you know, they talked about doing needs assessments like the Brits, but they did not do it. And I, I think part of it is they just don't want to, they don't want that accountability. Well, that's, I guess that's the problem. And and because I wanted to end today on a note about AI, because what we hear it in our Senate committees day after day after day is, we're not ready for any of this. Uh, not only do our programs not own and control um, intellectual property, but we haven't put through our entire banking and financial system the kinds of protections uh, that we need. Now, a, a new report on AI just, just out says, you know, there's a jobs apocalypse coming. Millions of jobs will be lost. We're not ready for that either. Um, and then there's others that say, but these are the people, as we've been discussing today, that are going to reinvent energy and change the world. And so the jobs are different. Where are you on the issue of whether AI is uh, the answer or the apocalypse? Yeah, I don't know. If, um, I could I could go one side. I don't think there. I don't think AI is going to be the apocalypse. Um, I mean, I, <laughs> I, I I definitely I I worry. Like other people worry, I'm sure keep people they stay up night. It just we have we have those kinds of scenarios, but I, I don't see it in AI per se. I, I just see it more in geopolitics right now. Yeah. You know, yeah. we have you know, we have wars with countries that have, that have nuclear weapons. I kind of I think that's a you know, that to me is much darker. I think that there's definitely productivity enhancing investments in AI, whether we are generating it, or you know, we're in terms of the AI itself, or whether we're implementing it, um, and uh, like I could see, like just even the work that you know my students are using ChatGPT as an example. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, have, I have neighbors that are doctors that you know that are, that are looking. They're starting to be, use AI related tools. We still need you know all their work, but their you know, their work is actually is much more data driven. And so they're, I think they're, get, they're getting better diagnostics out of these tools. Um, so the, I think there's enormous positive potential for productivity enhancement on the AI side. But I think like you and I, I think, Senator, like we lived to the 80s and 90s, the 2000s. We saw royal commissions. And I think they, we had royal commissions on different issues. And, you know, we would, you know, we got to the point where we said, you know, we had uh, a paralysis because of analysis. And now I think we have a kind of paralysis because we don't have analysis. Like we're not, we, we need to engage people, the technology community, citizens, stakeholders on AI. How do we want to manage it? We have a Digital Implementation Act. They talked about having an AI Act and Data Act. Like these are opportunities to engage people. So I, we to bring people together, maybe to new forums, maybe their constituent assemblies, different mixtures of people. I, I'm way more excited than uh, apple. Ap, I can't pronounce it. Apple, apple, apocalyptic. Ap, ap, apocalyptic. Well, there you have it. We're going to end on a uh, on a positive note. There, there is yeah. no apocalypse coming. Yeah, At least don't have to pronounce it again. <laughs> Kevin, great to speak with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator. What a joy. Thank you. It's great. Kevin Page, founding president and CEO of the Institute of Fiscal Studies and Democracy at the University of Ottawa, first parliamentary budget officer ever in Canada. And then I should remind people that in 2015, he did publish a book called Unaccountable, Truth and Lies on Parliament Hill. Just want to reassure you, there's still truth and lies on Parliament Hill. Senator, I should tell you that my kids um, for my birthday gave me a sweatshirt that says unaccountable. And they said that <laughs> had nothing to do with Minister Flaherty's statement. You're just unaccountable. <laughs> to them? You mean to them? Yes, to your children? Yes, as a father, as a grandfather. <laughs> That's very funny. Thanks, uh, Kevin, so much. We'll talk again soon. Thank you, Senator. Great. And that's it for No Nonsense with Pamela Wallen for today. We'll see you soon, too. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>